I think for for me it was uh I mean I've, I've always had a, a kind of general interest I think in just how things work um sort of a, a all the way you know through growing up as a kid I've, I've always wanted to, to fiddle with stuff and, and and tinker and that kind of thing um and for me sort of going through school it was biology in particular that just clicked for whatever reason um uh and really quite enjoyed it um and uh that was that ended up being what I uh, what I took on to university but um it wasn't a totally uh trouble free experience by the time I got to a level I was actually pretty disillusioned with with education um I at one point had dropped biology altogether um wasn't planning on going to university um was all all set to have just just completely abandoned ship um but in the end I, I had a year out before I went to university I worked for uh nine months or so of it and and figured that um that actually kind of sucked I didn't I didn't really enjoy that so I figured I would go to university um it seemed like the, the sensible choice um and at the time uh, biology was was the thing I did end up continuing with biology through a level it was my best a level um and ended up being the thing that I, I went on to do at university kind of fell back in love with education more generally and with biology and particularly at university um just the the way it's taught fits better for me I think um and being lectured to by people you know who are doing like the actual bench research and there's like real world science going on in the space um was was quite captivating and then as soon as I was able to do a, a an experimental lab project for my for my dissertation in my final year I knew like research was was it for me at that point um I it clicked again as I say and, and I really enjoyed it um, and then in, in particular, it was at university that I, you know, got introduced to, to what was the sort of growing field of synthetic biology um, at the time. Uh, and that kind of sealed the deal for me by, by about, I think, my second year, I'd already um, uh, decided that I thought a PhD made sense and I was applying for PhD positions. Um, so then uh, after that, I went... Um, I uh, went to Warwick, uh, where, where I was until just recently, um, to do a combined master's and PhD program um, that was actually in a really interesting um, doctoral training centre uh, where they um, they kind of fuse physical sciences and, and biological sciences. So the, the remit of the centre was to address um, life sciences questions with physical sciences approaches. Um, and so it was a really heavily like interdisciplinary focused centre um and uh through that i ended up on on the project that ultimately became our our spin out um so it was research that i was doing during my phd um <clears throat> and so uh all the way through phd um and a couple of postdocs um uh, i've been based here at, at warwick um in my uh, what was my supervisor's lab working on the science and about halfway through my PhD, I was kind of introduced to the concept of, of entrepreneurship and um, company formation. Um, and it sounded, we thought we had an idea that, that had some legs. Um, and uh, we started to flesh out the idea uh, of what we could do with it um, and of what we would need to do to, to be able to spin it out of, of the university. Um, then uh, we were able to finally do that at the beginning of last year. We got some funding um, and we've just closed another round of funding. Um, so now I'm I'm fully uh, in, in the company. I'm, I'm currently the, the CEO of, of our company, NanoSyrinx, which is a synthetic biology um, driven company that's working on novel uh, uh, delivery modalities, particularly for, for biologic payloads. Um, and so uh, I've been sort of in the company full time now for, for two or three months. Um, and prior to that, I was I was at Warwick. Um, and I think that's that's it. I think that's my sort of academic career in a nutshell. I think um, I mean, the obvious one, and I think probably most people would, would say it is that I, it's unusual to be working in, a, in an area of of pharma biotech where you are genuinely working on cures rather than treatments per se um you know a lot of cell and gene therapies do if if they can you know stand up to, to the promise and, and deliver um promise to be able to potentially cure people of of diseases that we just otherwise can't really address by other means a lot of the time um 
and I think that's you know that's borderline sci-fi stuff um and so I think it's really you know it's a really exciting space to to be looking at um and I think it's a uh, it's a really broad space as well. I mean, you know, everyone, when you think cell and gene therapy, you kind of think viral vectors and engineering cells and so on. But I think actually it's such a broad space. There are so many interesting modalities um, out there, uh, different ways of, um, you know, manipulating cells or, or, or applying proteins, biologics, whatever it might be in, in novel ways um, that potentially you can't perhaps do with some of the more classical approaches. Um, and part and parcel of that, I think, is um, kind of the regenerative medicine side of things. I think that will have or does and, and will have continue to have a lot of, of overlaps with cell and gene therapy. So, um, you know, if you're if you're engineering people's cells or you're using you're engineering stem cells to, um, to you know, to grow organs and, and the things, the kind of uh, things that we are doing again at the moment, you know, it's all pretty sci fi. And yet slowly but surely it's becoming a, a reality um so i think that that whole um sort of broad sector if you think about cell and gene therapy in kind of the broadest possible terms um it really is sort of a just a sea change in the way that we do medicine i think all, all around um and kind of more generally I, and i think this is part of the the philosophy i suppose for, for lack of a better word that that i've had with our company um is that i I think a lot of biological problems are best solved in biological ways. Um, you know, the, we're, we're working on a delivery vehicle that's derived from uh, a toxin system that bacteria use to, to intoxicate um, eukaryotic cells, you know. So this is a solution that, e that nature and evolution has come up with to, to address the exact problem of delivering proteins into cells, for instance. And I think leaning into you know stem cells doing what stem cells are good at and um viral vectors doing what viral vectors are good at is is absolutely the way that we should be trying to tackle these problems because i think somewhere out there biology has invented probably all of the tools that we're ever going to need um and i think cell and gene therapy will be both enabled and enable a lot of that um, as we go forward So, um, so as I mentioned, it's uh, the, the, the technology that I was working or the topic I was working on in my, my PhD um, was uh, this niche environmental bacteria that produces this, um, what is effectively a toxin delivery mechanism, as I mentioned. Um, so it's a virulence factor that the bacteria would ordinarily use um, to uh, manipulate part of life cycles of, of the organisms that interact with it uses them as, in immune suppression um, and to help establish infection basically um, and so when we were studying these we we realized that actually there's a really wide variety of the toxin components that go with these systems um, but the the delivery chassis that we refer to as a nano syringe um, and is kind of the core basis of our platform um, is broadly the same actually in all of the different kind of versions you see so it's a it's it's in effect a, a, a pre-existing kind of general purpose delivery vehicle so what we're doing is actually pretty pretty conceptually straightforward you know we're, we're taking something in from nature that already does job x um very effectively and has evolved to do exactly that and we're just tweaking bits here and there to make it you know bind to the cell types that we're interested in to deliver the payloads that we're interested in um and you know once you've once you marry those two aspects together you really have the, the makings of what a lot of people would consider you know an ideal delivery system it's, if it's targeted and it is able to deliver payloads particularly to the interiors of cells which is not straightforward at all um then then you're off to the races really um so the the company itself um got got going uh, as I mentioned it sort of informally started about halfway through my PhD um, we were doing pitches here and there with the with you know very kind of early iterations of the idea um, not a whole lot of data to go on at that point um, as is often the case with these early stage um, spin outs and things um, and so over the course of the sort of last part of my PhD and a couple of the postdocs that I did um, after that um, it was all geared towards generating the data that we needed to make it a compelling um, 
company prospect you know something that has the data that people need to see to to have some belief in it um and then uh once my phd was actually out of the way and i could focus on it a bit more um a bit more fully <clears throat> we uh we went out and started we were doing a lot more pitching um particularly through sort of 2019 this would have been um and then towards the end of 2019 we were able to um close a pre-seed uh, round which was just uh, sort of a few hundred thousand um which we paired up with a couple of um, grants from the likes of innovate uk um and so that funded us through most of last year um well all of last year i should say sorry um and then uh this was this funding was done with hitting a couple of kind of ip milestones and things um in mind uh it just so happened that we we actually got the money in the bank about two months before the entire world went into lockdown so it was a bit of a um slightly traumatic birth for the company but um we were able to keep working through the pandemic we still had lab access and so on um and so we were still able to hit all of the the relevant milestones uh and then um the sort of latter half of last year was was mostly focused on kind of the, the bigger proper fundraise that, that followed um so uh back in uh, i think it was J uh, end of july now we we announced the, the seed financing that we just uh, just closed so we have a, a really nice consortium of investors uh, involved now um and kind of the, the future is set now for about the next two years of the company to um start to to really develop um, the kind of more clinically relevant model um, exemplifications of the tech. Um, so just inching ever, ever closer to kind of the, the, the clinic really, um, as is, you know, the usual kind of process for these things. As I mentioned before, I, I like, I think leaning into to what nature is already doing is, is the way to go. Um, and I think that's exactly what we're doing. Um, when we were putting together the kind of value proposition for um, what we were working on, um, it became pretty apparent that there, there just really aren't any uh, sort of existing solutions to the problem of putting bioactive payloads, so particularly proteins and, and peptides, into cells, particularly into the interior of cells. And um, so obviously doing things like getting antibodies to cells and so on is something we're pretty good at now. But actually getting a payload inside the cell that you haven't had to do a lot of conjugation to or you've had to modify it in such a way that it survives endosomal trafficking and this, that and the other um, uh, really hasn't is, a, is an unmet need, I think, at the moment. Um, and so this is exactly what this nanostrin system that we've been working on does. It has the ability to, to, to target specific cells. It delivers bioactive payloads of a pretty um, diverse set of kind of biochemical properties and, and size and charge and all that good stuff. Um, and uh, it does so uh, in kind of what we refer to as an active mechanism. So the, the protein complex that the nanostringe itself is undergoes conformational changes to to force the payloads into the cell in effect so you're not waiting for endosomal trafficking you're not reliant on this the turnover of um cell surface markers like a lot of antibody type approaches are for example um and so i think the ability to deliver proteins in a targeted way particularly into directly into the interior of cells is really where um our tech you know if it, if it lives up to, to all of our expectations um really stands to to kind of yeah be a, be a bit of a game changer um and this was you know it's been echoed to us a few times in conversations we've had um i mean we have a bunch of of you know nice quotes on our on our pitch slides about how um delivering biologics is kind of the holy grail of drug delivery and and, and these types of of um statements from from the industry and from the sector um so you know if we can make it all work as we as we hope to i think we're you know we're really uh, potentially onto something